Welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm now delighted to welcome the speakers you've already heard from this morning, uh, plus Dr. Shani Gray, a GP and clinical lead for remote monitoring and care homes in London, and Lauren Bennis, an innovation coordinator from the Northeastern Yorkshire, who's worked on a mental health project. Um, presentations of their work, plus the work from colleagues in the Midlands, are available to watch on demand via this platform. And like all of the sessions from today, we'll be on the Innovation Collaborative NHS Futures platform in the coming weeks. Keep posing your questions in the Q&A section, but also use the chat to share your thoughts and indeed your experience, useful resources, links, etc., based on what you've heard so far. I'm going to start with uh, the words from uh, one of the questions, which is, very impressive because I completely agree. Um, fabulous work by teams across the country. Uh, we've got a, a general question, which is, uh, and I'm going to go to perhaps Andy and Megan on this in the first instance. Very impressive about what teams have achieved, but actually can you, things have happened really quickly because of the pandemic, um, but they're interested in how long the solutions took to deliver from scoping to the need to an MVP uh, product and then on to live use and actually Jay as well you mentioned MVP so we might come to you so if we go Andy Megan and then Jay uh, yeah really uh, really good question thank you um, Andy Barlow one, uh, one of the respiratory consultants at uh, West Hertfordshire NHS uh, Trust um, and was you know, sort of co-founder of our, our virtual hospital um, from from conception to birth it was actually five days and I'm, uh, further reflections uh, I've had suggest that's pr that's probably way too fast, but it was a situation of crisis. So um, uh, the first iteration of our virtual hospital model uh, really was very low tech, um, but we, we rapidly adapted uh, uh, whilst running the program to incorporate a more sophisticated technology uh, as we went, as we went on, which of course required DPIA. Um, uh, compliance, um, et cetera, uh, uh, as we incorporated some of the more uh, sophisticated technology platforms, which allow patients to feedback um, real time and, and have interactions with clinicians and provide physiologic data. So I'm not sure that answers the question, Breed, but I think the principle here was um, to be agile and flexible uh, and allow your model to evolve uh, real time, um, uh, identify the problems, uh, Identify, identify new, uh, new, new innovations and new improvements and build them in as you go. Um, so it's really all about flexibility. Great, thanks. And, and Megan, to add? Yeah, so I guess um, all in all, I think we started scoping to from, from July and we had a countywide um, service live by mid-November, um, but we implemented um, three... PDSA cycles um, in initially. So two of them were done with staff and, and relatives. Um, and the third PDSA cycle we did use with patients. So we were doing some patient treatment from about September. And then we had a phased implementation um, by locality during October and into November. Um, so I think all in all, probably four to five months, which re really in the um, NHS world is pretty rapid, um, especially with the amount of, you know, governance and red tape that we have to usually um, manage. And I think we were really supported by um, NHSD um, and, and E and I around um, some of this, removing some of those blockages. So the coping notices and things that we had to, um, that really helped us with the confidentiality and the IG management of stuff that we wouldn't in the regular world be able to um, work with at all so um, so yeah I think it was a pretty quick turnaround not five days as Andy man um, but still um, still um, very rapid in from from usual circumstances and hopefully something that we can continue to do because it would be a shame to have to go back to um, to service implementations taking 18 months plus when obviously we've proven that it doesn't it doesn't need to be Yes, it's it's uh, nothing like a crisis to uh, make things move at speed, but it is. How do we keep that ambition to be um, fleet of foot? Jay, anything you'd like to add? Because you mentioned your work on MVP. 
Yeah, I think somewhere in between uh, Megan and Andy in terms of timelines, but I think the important principles that both have pulled out there is that agile approach to the way you um, attempt to, to, to get your minimal viable product and then know that you're going to continually improve on that minimal viable product as you go. Don't wait to get it right before you get it started was our sort of principle um, and continually look to improve the, the cycles as you go. So nothing other than that to add uh, at this stage, Breed. Thanks, Jay. And then if I can come to Shani and Mark and perhaps back to you, Jay, as well. Uh, there's a question about uh, what's, what does this, what difference does this make for care home staff and care home residents? So uh, if I start with Mark and then go to Shani and then you, Jay. Okay, thanks, Breed. Um, I was looking just thinking about this in terms of two examples. Um, so I think the tech that we put into the care homes has been very well received and um, it's really important as a foundation for the digital remote monitoring. Um, certainly a care home here has given an example around um, uh, just having access to NHS mail, having an iPad to be able to send photos to the GP. Um, we've also provided training um, and uh, apps as well on, 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 the, on the iPads. Um, and if you think of that in the context of some homes only having one computer, staff having to use their own devices previously, having that infrastructure is important. I think moving into the digital remote monitoring, we're really starting to see care homes understand the benefits of doing Restore 2 monitoring uh, and monthly health, health reviews. They now understand that it helps the GP understand what's normal for their residents so we can make better clinical decision making. So I think that they understand uh, the benefits of the, the work that they're putting in. I think when we use to, uh, sorry, when we move to News 2 reporting, which will be effectively the GP asking the care homes to take readings every six hours or so, we'll see a lot less dependence on telephones and we'll see a lot more instant and responsive monitoring happening. Um, and we hope to get to a critical mass of care homes doing that around 160 in Kent and Medway. And I think we'll see better access to primary care as a result of that, because care homes are realising primary care is a, share, a very precious and shared resource. So I hope we're three to six months away from sort of seeing um, a different uh, perspective on how to access primary care uh, and be part of one integrated pathway. Thanks, Mark. Shani? Yeah, so I'm Shani Gray. I'm a GP in North Central London and we're doing remote monitoring in our care homes with Wazan. Um, I would say what our team has really found in terms of the benefits for staff in care homes is that this is doing something quite important in giving staff the kind of the language and the skills to be able to communicate with clinicians in a different way. And I think, and I can say this as a GP, often we underestimate some of the power dynamics that are at play actually. If a carer is worried about somebody and they're phoning up a GP or they're speaking to a paramedic through LAS, um, it can be quite intimidating, quite daunting. And actually for carers working in residential care homes, they're not clinically trained, not nurses, although they have got you know, amazing skills. And I think by doing the remote monitoring, they often know in their gut when somebody is unwell because they know, you know, Mrs. Smith and how she normally is and how different she is. Today. But when you communicate that to a clinician, it can often be seen as, OK, but what's really wrong with them or, you know, kind of doctors wanting to get to the meat of the problem, as it were. And I think that can often leave care and staff feeling quite kind of flustered and like they're able to communicate the needs that they can see that the residents have. So I think this gives really kind of hard objective data that they can then say, actually, I've done a set of observations and it's showing this, or the resident's news two score is this. So that kind of use of language and communication, I think, is really, really important with this. Um, and a lot we've had, you know, various carers reporting back to us that actually it's kind of giving them that layer of confidence that they were actually right in their thinking, that they did know something was wrong. And then by doing remote monitoring, that often confirmed that. And I think there's kind of a real sense of pride and confidence in how people are working. So I think it's adding a lot to that. And probably I think the third thing I would say is really around when um, care home staff are able to do remote monitoring, the way that our team have done it in North Central London is we have a fantastic team of nurse educators that work quite intensively with the care homes. 
And so it's meant that the carers can kind of, and the nurses can identify other learning needs that they may have. So it's not just that we're learning about remote monitoring and that's that. Actually, it's been a massive opportunity for them to really develop their skill set in a whole range of things and managing a whole range of kind of conditions, complexity and presentation. So I think it's giving them an opportunity to just really build on their skills in the round. And so we're finding that, you know, our nursing home and our care home staff are really getting quite a lot from doing remote monitoring with the residents. Great. Thanks, Shani. Jay, anything you'd like to quickly add? Um, yeah, just very quickly to say that we've <clears throat> we've taken time to make sure that we share the dashboards of the information that comes out of all the hard work and input from the care home workers so that they can see uh, just as tangibly as uh, Dr. Gray has described the benefits um, that they put into the system. They can see them. And I think that adds to this pride and gives them that professional standing as a workforce, which I think is hugely important to get them to continue to buy into this uh, digital transformation. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question, if I can come to Roz and Lauren, there's a question about patient engagement, about you know, uh, peer learning. Uh, would you like to comment on those? Um, it's basically, sorry, just trying to, there's lots of questions coming in, which is wonderful. Um, uh, the uh, Something about clear, concise, easy to use and understand communication, uh, uh, community, communities, peers, digital champions. Um, I don't know, Lauren, would you like to go first and then Ros? Hi, I'm Lauren Bennett. I'm the Innovations Coordinator for TESC and We Are Valleys NHS. Um, there are a few ways that we actually involved our patients in our project with the Alive Car 6 Lead ECG device. Um, we worked with M Habitat, who actually um, did a focus group with our patients just to make sure that our project was digitally inclusive um, and that there wasn't anybody who wouldn't be able to use the device for any reason. Um, we've also worked with our patients on a patient information sheet. So we're just working on that at the minute. And once we've finished our draft, our patient's going to prove it or give us any pointers, what they think we need to expand on or be more clear with. Um, and then finally, when we did the project, we asked our service users how what their views were um, around this new 6 lead ECG device that we'd, um, we'd um, implemented. Um, we asked our service users how easy it was, was it intrusive, um, around privacy and dignity, was it comfortable, um, and overall would they prefer this ECG device over the 12 lead. So we really included our service users in decision making around future care and what ECGs we would use um, in the future. Yeah, thanks. And I, I love the comment by one of your staff that says, if you take it away, I'll cry. You know, so that shows strength of feeling, I think, as well. Um, Ros? Um, so on, on um, working in partnership with the people that we're here to serve, I think it's absolutely essential. We have to remember why we're here and, um, um, and you know, the whole purpose of the, the NHS here. And for us, people are not the problem. They are the solution and part of the solution. So absolutely, co-designing in partnership with people right from the beginning, as soon as you can, will mean that we'll get the, the better end product. Um, so we're absolutely advocates for that. And I think we've often found in the past where we haven't done that, we've ended up with problems later on. And we really need to, you know, in particular, understand those people who need our health services the most. And those people, as we know, are more likely to actually be digitally excluded. So in this case, in this transformation programme, it's really important that we connect with people, that we understand what the issues and the barriers and the context are for those people, and that together we design inclusion into the digital transformation that we're doing. And I think we should always be asking ourselves, how um, are we ensuring that we're not compounding inequalities by this digital transformation and then on the other side of the coin which um, I know Breed you, you often talk about is you know how do we use digital innovation to overcome inequalities and I think some of the examples we've seen today actually are helping to do that so for example Lauren and the Alive Core you know there's a lot of um, reasons why that that 
particular piece of technology is actually more inclusive than 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 other sorts. It's not complete, you know, there are there are sort of challenges too, but actually, you know, it's it's both sides of the coin. And I hope that we really recognize the value of people's insights and experience in doing that. And you know, um uh, there's there's something also about the community organizations and the people that have and organizations that have got relationships of trust with those communities that we're we're trying to reach and working in partnership with those as well. And every right. and every area has got those community organisations, and they, uh, um, you know, we always say, you know, they never say no when you ask them if you could for for, for help. Thanks, Roz. And as always, it's been great to have you as a somebody to check in that we're doing the right thing and keeping us all on focus on this. So uh, keep the work, keep doing that. Um, so there's a couple of questions. Um, if I can come to Andy um, on uh, discharge and, and Megan uh, discharge criteria from virtual wards. Um, and Andy, specifically for you, maybe, oh, well, for both of you, actually, measurement of reduction in, in A&E attendances and GP appointments as a result. So some of the benefits uh, and the, then, sorry, there's three questions, if I can, uh, about new roles that might be required to really make this, um, you know, to, to do this uh, in a, at a really big, in a big scale. So Andy, shall I come to you first and then to Megan? I think you're on mute, Andy. Should we perhaps go to Megan first? Yeah, see if Andy can sort his... Uh... Out. Um, so yeah, okay. So uh, um, sorry, I didn't introduce myself before. I'm Megan Isaac, I'm a senior program manager for Gloucestershire CCG, and we implemented a community um, COVID virtual ward. Um, so in terms of the questions that you asked in in order, from from for discharge criteria, we didn't set anything specifically. I think we we have a very um, clear inclusion criteria for our um, our referral in pathways. Um, we set the time as two weeks um, from date of referral and the clinical um, advice recommendations that we'd had were that patients needed to be monitored for 14 days from their onset of symptoms. Um, so given the sort of lead in time from patients feeling poorly, getting their tests, getting their result and getting referred in, taking an average of two to three days, if it all worked well, we felt that their patients were fairly safe to be discharged after 14 days um, from referral. So they'd essentially be 17 days from um, their onset of um, their symptoms. However, patients were continually monitored twice a day over those two weeks. So um, if they were essentially green and, and their SATs um, were, were fine by the end of their two weeks, then they could be discharged appropriately. If they were still re um, recording red alerts so that they're, they're oxygen sats were not within the optimum parameters, then we would um, still discharge them within those two days because we'd set our modeling um, resource at two weeks per patient, but they would be um, handed over back essentially to the most appropriate um, organization to monitor them moving forward, whether that be secondary care or, or their GP, depending on their, um, their level of deterioration. Um, measurement in um, measurement, sorry, of um, admissions into hospital or GP attendances. So I suppose our model really, we wouldn't have wanted to see a reduction in um, secondary care referrals. Um, our model was very much based around the principle of as soon as patients um, recorded a reading that their oxygen saturations were below. Um, a safe level, they should be admitted as quickly as possible. We saw um, about a 17 to 18% um, admission rate from um, the 1300 patients that we saw through our ward, which we're very proud of. And the feedback that we had from secondary care was that they were all very appropriate to be seen. Um, and there were some patients that we've had you know, tremendous feedback from around that they, you know, they didn't even feel poorly. Um, and if they weren't escalated when they were, um, then they've been in a much worse position now. So um, we're very proud of our secondary care referral rates. Um, and I appreciate that is backwards to where we would normally um, measure those um, from, a, from a community service. Um, and finally, the development of new roles. We used um, GPs in a... Um, in and out of well, there are there are 
a community health center um so our G- gps mon- monitored the um readings coming in um i suppose the admin teams probably had the most development this is probably um more out of side of their um day-to-day job um there was a lot of reactive um work done and the um the collaboration between the two providers that we had of the ward so we had our telehealth provider baywater and our clinical provider gdoc the um, collaborative working between them was absolutely fantastic and probably not something that they do um, on the regular either. So um, in terms of skill development, then I think that's, um, that's definitely one of the key areas that we've, we've seen. Great, thank you. I think we still have a slight issue with Andy's at sound, so we'll come back to Andy, uh, unless he tells me otherwise. Unless you can do very good. <laughs> uh, uh, I, actually, Mark, uh, from a care home perspective, uh, I should actually acknowledge, sorry, Megan, uh, I think what you've highlighted is, that, you know, the measurement of a reduction in something we normally look at as a real benefit. In this case, we were actually really making sure we were optimizing that the right patients got the right care in the right place. And that's just, you know, a really fabulous um, outcome. Uh, so, Mark, over to you in terms of impact from the care home work. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, just to share from Kent and Medway, the COVID oximetry work over winter, um, we used a combination of digital remote monitoring and, and manual monitoring as well. Um, we monitored 6,000 patients. Uh, about three quarters of those actually for COVID oximetry were in the community and about a quarter were in care homes. Um, overall, we saw about a 5% admission to, to the emergency department. Um, I think very similar uh, to the previous speaker, we, we were intending to get patients to ED where it was um, clinically the best thing to do, to stabilise those patients who are deteriorating and then get them home or uh, either in the community or the care home uh, and, and stabilise because that would result in better better outcomes and, and survival rates. Um, so, uh, But I think the 5% is a positive indicator that that early intervention was working well and the pathways were we're really working um, seamlessly. Breed, I, I know it was a previous question about exclusion, but I, I just, I'm happy just to share something because it's something we're absolutely focused on. Um, what's really interesting is when we look at other digital systems at scale, so uh, we're seeing about 50%, so half of all users access digital NHS services using their mobile phones. So we, wow. hope we, yeah, we were very surprised, and that is in some very deprived areas as well. So we've, we want to guard against digital exclusion and, and mitigate that in, in everything we do. Those results seem surprisingly positive. So people without perhaps broadband are still able to access services using mobile phones and uh, smartphones. Um, and I, I think when we roll out digital remote monitoring further at scale, we, we should be using that as one of the benchmarks, particularly for people at, at home who we're monitoring in, in that way. Obviously, in care homes, there will be the tech and infrastructure to do that. So uh, just something we learned this week from reviewing, it was online consultations, actually, we were looking at it in that area. Um, but okay. I think as we go into digital remote monitoring, we should be uh, looking at comparable benchmarks and seeing why uh, hopefully digital remote monitoring will be higher than that and if it's lower we would definitely need to understand why why that might be the case so j- just thought I'd share our, our yeah. learning uh, as we go along. Thank you Ros would you like to quickly make any comment on that and then we I think we've got Andy back so I'll come back to you Andy but Ros do you want to comment on that? No I think that that's really interesting what what we have to be careful of is there's a lot of complex different factors for digital exclusion it's not just you know have I got a device or haven't I got a device um, and the first thing that sprung to my mind there was how much did it cost them? You know, what was the data sort of cost in, in that as well? And we do have to consider that going forward. And I know there's a big campaign around zero rating health apps and so on, uh, which I really support. Um, and then the other things to think about are, are stuff around people's life context. So it's going to be different for different communities. So, for example, if you're homeless or living with domestic violence or you know, lang- uh, English isn't your first language, there will be other complexities. Um, alongside things like digital skills and confidence and motivation 
And obviously what's really important here, which I think I know that all, the, all my colleagues here today have been thinking about is around accessibility of our tools and of our processes and the digital skills and confidence and capability of the staff that are using it. And I know that's a, an important issue within, um, or challenge if you like, within um, care homes. So it's very complex, it changes over time and we need to keep our eye on that, but yes, yeah. it'll be interesting. Yeah, so good progress, Mark. But I like for all of us, there's, it's going to be unpeeling the onion and really getting to the big benefits. Andy, can I come back to you on those three questions? Yeah, thank you. Hopefully you can hear me now. Yes, loud and clear. Um, so uh, just in, uh, dealing with the discharge uh, uh, criteria question, um, when we originally set up the model in the first, well, the earlier iterations, it was a 14-day pathway, and I think that's very similar to uh, uh, to, to others. But uh, what we quickly learned was actually some patients um, uh, needed longer. So we, we became increasingly flexible, um, uh, certainly towards um, wave two. And indeed, we had a group of patients that have been on uh, an extended pathway. Um, and, and part of that was, uh, uh, was uh, perhaps not so clinically necessary, but the patient found it uh, beneficial as they moved into a more uh, long COVID type um, scenario so I think the key key there was flexibility but but uh, ultimately we wouldn't we wouldn't and didn't discharge people that from the virtual hospital that um, had had clinical data that would uh, that was of any concern um, in terms of the benefits of the service and that was the second question um, I would really cl uh, classify those into hard and soft and I mean we had some KPIs linked with um, the virtual hospital around readmission rates and mortality. Um, and we, we published our data uh, 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 on those. But overall, our, our readmission rate was uh, less than 8% for the 4,500 patients um, we've so, so far onboarded through our virtual hospital. And bear in mind, there's the BMJ publication from last year, which showed that readmission rates at 90 today's is in excess of 30% nationally. Mm. So, so numbers less than 10%. Um, uh, you know, really represent um, a significant benefit both to the patients and, and to the healthcare service for the resources uh, that are stretched at the moment. Mortality rates are very important to track and, uh, and ours were approximately two and a half percent. And we can provide data on all, all of our deaths in terms of what happened in the pathway, pathway they follow. And actually it was very, very appropriate. Almost uh, all but one of those patients um, were readmitted to the main hospital, uh, but unfortunately followed a, a progressive um, course that we couldn't modify clinically. Um, and one patient had had a, uh, um, an arranged and managed um, uh, death in the community with li linking in with the palliative care services, which is another another example of how we integrated with um, with community partners. The soft benefits really um, were around how the patient felt, and actually. We, we have run patient forums subsequently, um, ma mainly to prime and get, get um, uh, input for the new path pathways that we're developing. We learned a lot about um, patient views and um, actually they're quite surprising. And, and I took away from that meeting the, um, the need not to um, assume a, um, uh, where the patient might, might be in terms of their journey toward incorporating Digital, uh, digital health technology in the care in their care. Uh, uh, there were some very surprising responses from from people that you might think might be um, not engaged with computers, not engaged with dig digital technology. So I think the key thing is to ask the patients, and they'll surprise you more often than not. Um, there are a small group that are dig uh, are digitally excluded, and and you know they need a different solution. Um, but the but the, the the soft benefits are around having care in your own home. Um, and the comforts therein with with carers that uh, uh, that know you, and I don't think we should underestimate those. Lastly, in terms of the new roles and opportunities, um, I think I think for us this this has generated the need for um, specific data, digital data managers um, that either work in the hospital or in the community wherever the virtual hospital sits, because um, because there's a real need for um, data accrual real time. And for and for reporting into the clinical governance structures of your institution, um, and you need to be thinking about how you embed your your digital services within your corporation or, or hospital, um, so that uh, outcomes um, and benefits are, are are reviewed on a monthly basis, 
and go through your your data data compliance and governance process to the, uh, and report ultimately ultimately to the board. So um, I think there's uh, there's need for sort of a digital health directorate or department in in wherever you work that 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 will link in and manage these. So it is creating new roles. That's very uh, that's very clear for us. Wonderful, thank you, Andy. Sadly, we've just we've run out of time, which uh, I think this conversation could go on, uh, and let's continue it perhaps in on social media through the Innovation Collaborative Workspace. Uh, you know, this day, this is it's a bad collaboration. What we've what we've seen is lots of sharing, reducing duplication, pinching with pride, and acknowledging. And we want to continue that. But thank you to all our speakers um, and to our panel, and look forward to continuing to work with you all. Um, and if you just stay with us, we will quickly move to the next session where we'll be joined by Tim Strawn, our Director of NHS at Home.